I remember reading uh, several years ago that one particular airline company stopped putting lettuce on their sandwiches they served on flights, which literally saved them millions of dollars a year. Imagine just withholding a piece of lettuce saved them millions of dollars. The idea obviously must have caught on because now they withhold the whole sandwich and give you <laughs> peanuts. It's amazing how pennies add up to real money. This newspaper reporter that wrote that did some digging and found out that a one cent per gallon increase in the price of fuel increases Delta Airlines corporate costs $25 million a year, just a penny a gallon. He also found out that a one penny increase in the price of Coca-Cola per case, not can, but per case, one penny per case brings the company an additional $45 million a year. A one cent increase in the hourly wage for all the employees at Home Depot amounts to $6.5 million a year. Here's one I thought was interesting. If, if Krispy Kreme increased the cost of each donut by one penny, the company would increase annual profits by $27 million. And it would still be worth every penny, right? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how much difference a little penny can make? The truth is, in money and in life, something small can add up to making a major impact in someone's life. Today, it might be a pat on the back of someone near you or a hug, the question of how you're doing and the pausing to listen. It can be small, but it can deliver a great impact. We arrive at the conclusion of a small act. Uh, we're going to go back one more time, this last time today, to Second John, a small letter. I've referred to this small letter as an inspired postcard, written to an anonymous woman and her children, and just a brief little note, but it's going to make a lasting impact on her life and nearly 2,000 years later to the church today. We're still loving every word of this note. So let's go back one more time as we wrap it up. He writes, we're at verse 12 now, though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink. I hope to come to you and speak face to face. Now stop for a moment. John obviously doesn't want to end his letter with the last paragraph. It was a strong, a rather blunt command for this woman to watch out, beware of false teachers, keep, keep them out of her home, which would have given them a vantage point for ministry no doubt to the church that met in her home. He, he wants to end the letter with gracious words. So he, he rather quickly changes gears here. In fact, the forward placement of, in the original language of the words, many things, tells us that there were a number of topics that he hasn't mentioned in the letter, but he wants to discuss them. He doesn't want to write about them. He wants to discuss them face to face with her and her, her family, more than likely as well the believers who met in her home. He has, a, he has a better idea than writing, making it longer, he's going to visit. Um, by the way, and we could, we could kind of go so fast that we miss some of these telling remarks, but the word he uses here for paper, I found interesting. It's from the word that refers to a common sheet of papyrus rather than the more expensive parchment, which would have been available if he'd had the money made from leather. Uh, the papyrus plant had been providing the pulp for common paper in John's generation and for generations before him. It grew in long stalks. It flourished there in the Mediterranean world. It literally grew like weeds, one author wrote. 
Marcia and I, in fact, last year were given uh, by um, a woman in our church a couple of papyrus plants, and we planted them in the backyard and, and to see what would happen, and they grew. They just sort of took off like weeds, which is great because our backyard grows weeds really well, but this worked wonderfully. They grew about six feet tall and bent over, beautiful plumage at the tips of these stalks, and we're kind of hoping they grow back this spring. Well, for generations before John's lifetime, they're making paper. They'll take that outer shell and strip it away and then take the inside sticky gummy portion and cut it in thin strips and, and lay them horizontally and overlap the edges. And then they'll take another layer and lay them crosswise or vertically in this manner and, and uh, intersect in that way and then they will lay it down somewhere on a flat surface with something heavy on top for a while pressing it down and then they'll put it out in the sun to dry this is um, this is what John is writing on it's a common uh, piece of parchment paper in fact the size of it uh, would have been around five inches uh, wide which is the width of my study note and just a little taller, about eight inches tall, like uh, the normal common stationery you use today. The edges uh, would have some glue applied and they could attach another piece next to it and make a longer roll they could use for longer uh, documents or, or letters. Uh, several scholars uh, that I read suggested here that the Apostle John more than likely reached the bottom of one piece of parchment and he didn't want to go any further into page two. Well, we do know that John, as well as all the authors of Scripture, uh, weren't just writing on their own behalf. They were moved by the Holy Spirit, writing under his direction, 1 Peter 1.21, 2 Timothy 3.16. So that when John did come to the bottom of that papyrus sheet, he hadn't run out of you know, space, and he didn't want to, you know, go to page two. He had written all that mattered in the mind of God for him to write to this woman. The word he uses for ink is equally telling. It's a word that simply means black. It was the word for cheap ink. It was made from a mixture of ash and water and tree sap. There were better grades of black ink. There were uh, combinations of minerals that provided blue and even red. Would have been more expensive, better quality. We also know that his word for pen simply refers to a reed pen that predated John by centuries. You know, we have in our minds that they're chiseling on stone back in those ages. No, they... <laughs> They, they were brilliant. It was a hollowed reed where they'd pour this ink into it and a tiny slit at the bottom of the tip of that reed would draw the ink down. And here John is scratching out a letter on this little piece of cheap papyrus paper with cheap ink. And I say all that to say this. Here's the last living apostle. Here's the... Here's the renowned author of books in the New Testament. The book of Revelation. The Gospel of John. First, second, and third John. Now this old, more than likely in his early to mid-90s, he's writing his last two little letters, second and third John. And all he seems to have in his possession is some cheap paper and some common cheap ink. But my point is this. That's what he used. Because that's what he had available. He used what he had. Whatever God makes available to you, beloved, use it. Well, I'd write a note to her or him, but I, I don't have my nice stationery. 
You know, it's in my favorite pen. Inconvenient. Here's the point. Whatever God has put in your hand, use it with all your might. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whether it's ordinary stationery or a cheap pen or a simple talent or a gift, and maybe you wish you had more, but this is what he's placed in you. Maybe it's a a larger position of influence. Whatever it might be, in fact, that doesn't even matter. What matters is you use what he's put in your hand for his glory. Use it. God will never get on to you or rebuke you for not using something he never gave you to use. We're the ones that pine about that. What he does do is hold us responsible to use whatever he has given us to offer to others. And so what does John have? Cheap papyrus, inexpensive ink, Ordinary stuff. But as one author wrote, this letter, wow, it it shines like a bright star in the galaxy of the New Testament. So it does. Well, John, more than likely, does reach the bottom of his sheet. The spirit is finished with this particular note. Ink is still wet. Now he has an announcement, last part of verse 12. I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy might be full. I hope. The the verb he uses means that he's made up his mind. It's his decision to come, but he hadn't, hadn't, you know, mapped out all the plans yet. That's the idea of this this verb. By the way, I love the fact that this old man is making plans I mean, that's a sermon all in itself. Isn't that great? What are you doing? Well, I'm 93 years old, for heaven's sake. I'm not doing nothing. Not John. I got plans. I got a trip. I want to make it. I want to come visit you. Uh, I I don't know the exact arrival date. Uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to show up. Uh, But I've made the decision, and and notice, I want to come and speak to you face to face, stoma. Prostoma, literally translated, it would read mouth to mouth. It's a common expression in this original language when mouth to mouth. When, when we hear that expression, we think of somebody's dying and they need mouth to mouth resuscitation, right? Not to the Greeks. This was an expression that meant close proximity. We might say eye to eye, nose to nose. It's translated in my Bible, face to face. Personally, I think the best expression that captures uh, John's desire would be the expression, I want to come and and be with you so that we can talk heart to heart. Heart to heart. I don't just want to talk to you and and your your family sitting in your your living room. Yes, I, I want to do that. And I'm giving you a heads up that I'm coming so that when I get there, you'll have some sweet iced tea and some chocolate chip cookies. Oh, never mind. That's my, that's my letter. No, I just want to talk to you. And notice, this kind of conversation will bring what? Joy, you could render it, to the fullest. In other words, being together with him and talking with him about subjects he had in mind that he hadn't included in this letter, and you could just let your imagination go, what would it be that John would like to talk to her about and her kids? Oh, you can imagine maybe some great theme of his gospel account, maybe some story that he had, some anecdote about traveling with the Lord, or maybe just a little bit more information than he included in Revelation about his vision of heaven. Wouldn't that be great? Have him in your living room where you can just talk about his tour of heaven. Wow. And and the result of this conversation, you could expand the text to read, in order that your joy, having been filled completely full, might persist. It might linger on. You ever had that kind of conversation with somebody? And, and, And the joy of a discussion about Christ just lingers on. That's the idea. So he wants to see them personally and have this conversation. 
That John ends his letter by sending yet another greeting. Verse 13, the children of your chosen sister greet you. I don't want to be tedious and replay uh, old ground here, but I, I think it's important that we take this literally. John sends greetings to her from her sister's children. These are real, literal nephews and nieces that John knew, more than likely part of his church in Ephesus. It would be odd for the sister to not send her greetings, and you notice here that the sister isn't sending her greetings, just her children. This would be a snub to a church if it were letters between churches. The metaphor becomes just too strained. It's best to take this letter as written to a literal woman with literal children who's in need of a, a literal warning not to host literal false teachers who are, who are wanting to stay in her literal home. She has a, a literal sister who may not even be alive at this time or she's somewhere else when John writes this note. But there are some literal nieces and nephews who are sending their greetings back to their literal aunt. In fact, look over at 3 John. Lord willing, we'll start this postcard next Lord's Day. 3 John, look at verse 13. I had many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly and we will speak face to face. Does that sound remotely familiar? I think it does. And this letter is announced in, in, addressed to Gaius, verse 1. But here in 2 John, another personal note, very similar, very personal. He leaves out this woman's name, I think wisely, no doubt to protect her identity, given these days of growing hostility toward Christians, especially difficult days for a single mother, perhaps. Perhaps uh, he's using discretion because she is a widow or maybe married to an unbeliever who wouldn't be interested in this letter and could cause trouble or rumors. What we do know is that he's gotten word, and it might have been from these nieces and nephews. Hey, our aunt is open to hospitality, and you know her well, John, and these false teachers, we've learned, are heading her away, and there needs to be a warning. She's going to give hospitality to these itinerant preachers, and, and you need to, need to encourage her and warn her. Make sure they are preaching the right Jesus, remember? The right gospel. The children of your chosen sister greet you. And with that, we conclude our exposition of this bright star in the galaxy of the New Testament. But before we set it aside, let me rehearse seven principles that we've learned along the way. I mean, you didn't think I was finished, did you? <laughs> We'll finish by at least one o'clock. All right, here we go. Number one, this letter should teach us that the truth of God's word is intended to become a way of life. Remember how John began pounding away with the truth, the truth, the truth. I love you all in the truth. I'm writing for the sake of the truth. I rejoice that you are walking in the truth. I mean, truth is, is life. Christianity isn't a Sunday morning hour. Christianity is life. It's a walk. How obvious is your Christianity to your neighbors, to your classmates, to your clients? And D.L. Moody used to say the Bible should be bound in shoe leather. I love that. Shoe leather. Take it outdoors. Live it out. Put it into practice. Number two, exposure to truth, we learned, does not guarantee the reception of truth. These false teachers were exposed to the truth and they rejected it. John is speaking transparently to this mother's heart as we studied when he writes in verse 4, how glad he was to know that some of her children were walking in the truth. That is, they were believers. Some of them were not. No doubt, the desire of her heart, a prayer that was always on her lips, for all her children to be saved, maybe that is your prayer 
today more than any other prayer. Number three, embracing the truth of Christ is never separated from demonstrating the love of Christ. Love and truth go hand in hand. Our challenge is to balance. Uh, there are times we'd just rather love and forget the truth. Or we're going to deal with them in truth and forget love. Love and truth. Beloved, we can fool ourselves and we can end up damaging our own personal testimony as well as the effectiveness of the church. John makes it clear in verse 5 that to obey the commandments of God is to act in love toward one another. The command to love one another in verse 5, remember that's in the original context where it was first delivered by Jesus to his disciples. That disciple community, and later here, as it's repeated by John, it's in the context of the local church. Uh, to put this in the simplest terms possible, if, if there is somebody in the church that you are acting toward in an unloving manner, either in front of them or behind their back, don't kid yourself. You are not obeying the commands of Christ. This is, this is where love and truth go hand in hand. This body, this assembly, this gathering, this campus, if anything, ought to be marked by grace and graciousness and love and support and encouragement. And if you're unloving, you're not obeying the command of Christ. So in, in a practical way, a church is is not made better by better climate control or better coffee, and I'm all for that. Better programming, better parking, better music, better sermons. Be careful. No, the church is made better by better relationships where truth and love Go hand in hand. Number four, even faithful believers are never free of spiritual danger. Remember, John is writing to a faithful woman. The word chosen can be rendered choice. She's a choice believer, an older woman. And he's telling her to watch out. Don't miss that. He's telling her to steer clear of false teaching. I thought the older you got, you know, the more inoculated you became against false teaching. Now he's telling her, don't get tripped up and lose your fullest reward when you stand before him. Now, see, no matter how old you are in the Lord, you can never say, you know, I got this Christianity thing down pat. No, at that, at that point, you are in your greatest moment of peril. Take heed while you are standing, lest you fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Nobody has Christianity buttoned down, no matter how old you are in the Lord. Nobody has Christianity nailed down. Nobody's beyond false teachers' delusions. It's why you stay in the truth. You stay in the teaching. You keep your nose in the book. He's writing to a faithful woman with a testimony of godliness and to her children, some of them who are known for walking in the truth, and he tells them, be careful. With that in mind, number five, don't assume that everyone speaking in the name of Christ belongs to Christ. Don't assume that everybody that names, you know, uses the name of Jesus belongs to Jesus. They're coming to your home, John warns her. Keep your eyes open. Keep your door closed. Keep your wallet shut. You remember? Make sure you evaluate every teacher in light of this teaching, verse 10. If they come to you and don't bring this teaching, 
Don't let them pass your front porch. As we've learned in this letter, the devil has his own agenda. The devil has his own false systems. The devil has his own spokesmen. The devil has his own preachers. The devil has his own miracle workers. He has his own global workers spread around the world. And remember, they are passionate about their disciple-making mission. Just as passionate as you are. And using biblical terminology, and even the name of Jesus, has opened more doors for the devil than any other method. Number six. The older you grow in Christ, the less you need to experience joy. The less you need. I've been reading a little history of the North African church and I came across a proverb. And it goes like this, translated rather woodenly into English. Haste haste but no blessing I really need to put that on the dash of my pickup truck you know haste haste no blessing the idea is we run through life I mean we're, we're rushing 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 and we miss so many blessings we don't even see them there was a time when John was in a hurry. You study his life in a hurry. I mean, he wanted immediate results. Remember that village they came to? They didn't believe. He said, let's toast them right here, Lord. Bring down fire. They had their chance. One and only. We're done. We're moving on. No results. Let's go. That's John. At, a, at one point, he says, yeah, that kingdom, I believe it. Let's go. Can't wait. Bring it on. By the way, would you give my brother James and me thrones, one on either side of you, I mean, let's make this thing matter and let's, let's make it happen, Lord. That would bring me wonderful joy. Not now. Here's what I want. I, I would, I would, I'm planning to come to your home and what I want to do is sit down with you and your family and my joy by talking with you will be filled up and it will linger on no gimmicks no glory no fanfare just us one more and this brings us full circle no one number seven no one in the family of God is too insignificant to protect and encourage. I mean, how encouraged this mother would have been to read this letter and reread this letter, his words of warning and care and hope. I mean, John is, John is the renowned apostle. You don't think they wanted his signature back then? They sure did. I mean, he's, he's the great author. He penned the gospel account. He penned these letters. He penned Revelation. I mean, he saw heaven in its glory. He was given visions. Few were ever given. And now in his mid-90s, what are you going to write now, John? And remember, he says, well, I'm going to write a little note. I got a little cheap ink, some cheap paper. And there's a woman I want to write along with their children, who could use a word or two of warning and instruction and encouragement. What, what a model for us. Get in touch. Get in touch. Send a, send a private message. Send an email. Write a letter. There's this thing called an envelope. And, and stamps, you lick. There's a place called post office with happy people working. Oh, I made that part up. I mean, listen, beloved, if you had one more day to live, one more day to live, who would you contact?
With whom would you reconcile? Who would you call? Who would you visit? What are you waiting for? Today is all we have. Maybe today you've got a letter to write or a phone call to make or somebody to go see. Many years ago, and with this I close, a middle-aged pastor by the name of William Stidger was reflecting on his gratitude for a teacher he had had in his younger years. The teacher who had sparked in him a love uh, of reading. And maybe you have a teacher in your past that did the same. I certainly do in mine, a fourth grade teacher. He reflected that this was the woman that really helped prepare him for what would become his future vocation in ministry and writing. And he realized that he had never, ever thanked her and she came to mind. So he decided. He sat down, found out her contact information, now uh, living alone, and wrote her a letter of thanks. Several days later, he received a reply written in a shaky scrawl. It read, My dear Willie, she evidently remembered him, even though it had been decades. My dear Willie, I am now an old lady living alone in a small room, cooking my own meals, a bit lonely, seemingly like the last leaf of fall has already fallen. You'll be interested to know, Willie, that I taught school for over 50 years, and in all that time, yours is the first letter of appreciation I have ever received. It came on a blue, cold morning, but it brought joy to my old heart as nothing has cheered me in so many years. Wow. No act is too small, no one is too insignificant to demonstrate the love of Christ, to reach out, to protect, encourage, support, thank, cheer on as we walk together in the truth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.